Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Marvel's What If Episode 8, What If Ultron 1, a truly terrifying age of Ultron that even the Watcher and his fighting PJs can't stop. This episode was filled with interesting Easter eggs and MCU implications, so I'm gonna break it down frame by frame for everything you might have missed. We open on the Watcher, his outline framed in the snow of post-apocalyptic Moscow. Unlike past appearances, his silhouette has retreated behind the elements of our atmosphere, reflecting how powerless he now seems this episode. Episode, with the falling snow like pieces of himself as he risks dematerializing into obsolescence. He laments, We've seen this before, a universe in the final days of destruction. But this particular story, this, this one breaks my heart. I'm curious about the exact timing of the Watcher's narration. By we've seen this before, he seems to be referring to past apocalyptic episodes he's shown us, like the Doctor Strange and the Zombies episodes, but it's not clear if this Watcher was the one who reacted to Ultron's arrival to Party Thor in Episode 7. So is the story that breaks his heart the story of Ultron's destruction of Earth that we're about to see, and he's now speaking to us right before the moment Ultron sensed him? Or are we seeing a truly defeated Watcher speaking to us as a ghost beyond his cosmic grave, and his heartbreak is really coming from the story of what Ultron is about to do to the multiverse in the second half of this two-part finale event. Is this evidence of multiple Watchers? I have some thoughts on this later. But here Natasha Romanoff roars past on a motorcycle, her taillight bleeding a streak of red like blood in the water luring some predators, in this case Ultron sentries. Meanwhile Clint Barton's arm was replaced with one from an Ultron sentry, showing how in this machine-dominated post-apocalyptic world he must supplant his flesh with pieces of that which he hates. But it's worth noting that this is now the arm in hand that Clint uses to release his arrows, so he does benefit from the technological precision of those robotic motor functions. Clint's cloak is made from the same mesh fabric that Natasha and Melina and Sharon Carter have used for cloaking purposes. Clint does rely mostly on his sentry arm to do the heavy lifting, but as he fires a hole through one of their heads, notice how the camera frames his human hand through the kill hole, a way of showing triumph of man over machine. And Natasha helps Clint to his feet, avoiding joking Nita Han, claiming puns aren't her style, yet notice the next line. Puns aren't really my style. We're getting rusty. Getting rusty, as in Clint's mechanical arm collecting rust. Yeah, she loves puns. Then the Watcher rewinds the clock to Tony's invention of Ultron. I see a suit of armor around the world. A direct quote from Age of Ultron. I see a suit of armor around the world. Back then, Tony designed Ultron to operate his Iron Legion, an idea he pitched to Bruce Banner, and I love how in that conversation it inspired this what if hypothetical given the little exchange between them in that moment. That's a man sized if. Our job is if. Ultron goes online, and in this moment, he's weirdly already in his later form, not the disembodied AI he was born as in the film, and then shortly after, the broken Iron Legion drone, actually that was the same one that the Sokovian protester defaced in the opening scene of the movie. But then this Ultron cross-dissolves into the body that would later become Vision, resting in the cradle in Helen Cho's South Korean facility. This transition neatly shows how Ultron successfully merges with the Vision body this time, instead of Helen Cho pausing the upload at 42 percent in the film. And notice how when he opens his eyes, they glow Ultron Red, the color that shows his consciousness in any given Sentry drone, contrasting Vision's blue eyes. But remember, Helen Cho was only able to stop that upload when Wanda Maximoff dispelled her from the Mind Stone's mind control. It's just worth noting how many of these Nexus moments really come down to the decisions of Wanda Maximoff or Stephen Strange, who will be the pivotal characters in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. And speaking of Nexus, the Avengers defeat by Ultron goes down in the Nexus internet hub in Oslo, Norway, seen briefly in Age of Ultron when Tony Stark tried to track Ultron's movement through the internet. And is this just the center of everything? I'm just a guy looking for a needle in the world's biggest haystack. Oh, I'm decrypting nuclear codes and you don't want me to. Aha, so Ultron ascends on his path toward becoming a Nexus being at the Nexus Internet Hub. Now, theoretically, Ultron's assimilation would have occurred right as Tony made that crack about the nuclear codes, which could have actually led Ultron to this place to initiate global nuclear annihilation, which is way more fun to wipe out the human race than throwing a chunk of a city back at the surface. You don't have to do this. I made you for peace. It's evolution. Only a primitive mind would fail to see the distinction 
Which is why you have to die. Now, replacing James Spader as Ultron this episode is Ross Marquand, the voice of Red Skull. Now, notice the visual of Cap's shield broken in half and his body strewn alongside those of Thor and Hulk as Stark is just left to watch it all. This is exactly Tony's nightmare vision cursed into his mind by Wanda Maximoff come true. And this episode makes it the fourth one to kill off Tony Stark, really the only Avenger to die on screen in every repeat appearance on the series. It's almost as if this guy needs to die for the multiverse to move forward. Actually, I have a video coming out in a few days exploring how Stark's death may actually be an absolute point. Now, during the sequence, the Watcher's hand swipes over the frame, transitioning it with this kaleidoscopy texture from the main MCU reality to this alternate one. These what did happen slides have always had a storybook aesthetic in past episodes, and now we see why. Because to the Watcher, he is flipping through the pages of what's essentially a comic book that he's already read, and in his case, peering from one crystalline window into another. Thaddeus Ross watches in horror as ICBM strike all over the world. Notice how one ICBM from the Texas region, if you follow its trajectory, is headed right for Wakanda, which Ultron must recognize as a global superpower alongside the US and Russia and China. Thanos portals into the aftermath just as he arrived in Infinity War. Now he already possesses the power, space, reality, soul, and time stones, meaning he must have begun his stone quest earlier in this universe. Perhaps Ultron killing Thor and or the Ancient One in the nuclear blasts could have cleared a path for Thanos to go to Xandar for the power stone, to Asgard for the space stone, and so on. However, Gamora is still alive on the Sovereign, so he could not have sacrificed her on Vormir to get the Soul Stone. Now, Gamora could have sacrificed Nebula to get the Soul Stone, but would she have parted ways with it without giving her life? Hmm. See, folks, when it comes to the Infinity Stones, this show doesn't really consider their exact continuity that big a priority, it turns out. So we are best chalking it all up to... In other universes, the stones are wherever they need to be for the story to work. Ultron uses the Mind Stone to slice Thanos in half on Avengers Tower. What the hell? Well, I suppose if you consider that Thanos could have been clouded by his Malthusian ambitions, and by comparison, Ultron as a super efficient robot brain could have quickly mastered his stone's fullest potential to get the draw on this eco-terrorist who's still figuring out how his toys work exactly. But uh, yeah, it is nuts to see Ultron wield the Mind Stone so perfectly to fillet Thanos and melt a Nidavellir gauntlet. And so Ultron plugs in the five remaining stones into his new armor. Wow, there are worlds that need me. Yeah, notice how the stones emit that heavy tone. The same sound that we heard Thanos' gauntlet would make an Infinity War when emitting stone energy. Ultron materializes an army of sentries using the reality stone, but also they come together in this black ink dot effect. Now in comics, this is known as the Kirby crackle or the Kirby dots created by artist Jack Kirby, who would use similar dots to convey cosmic negative space around energy. These Kirby dots return around most of Ultron and the Watcher's attacks later in this episode, and it elevates Ultron to a Jack Kirby cosmic level character like Galactus. And I love when the show uses ink in this way, like how they showed Doctor Strange's universe melt back into comic book style ink, the base elements that form all of these characters. Ultron first destroys Asgard. I think the imagery looks a lot like when those alien battleships strike skyscrapers in Independence Day. But if you go through frame by frame as Asgard explodes, notice the water pouring down from the edges of the disc vaporize before the whole plane obliterates, just like it did when Surtur destroyed it in Thor Ragnarok. Then onto the Sovereign, which you remember from Guardians Volume 2, and we see Peter Quill and Gamora and Drax fighting on that same platform that they fought the Abelisk. And since this is in 2015, this is a place they already would have been to because Guardians Volume 2 takes place a month after Guardians Volume 1. Then we go on to Sakaar, where sentries pour into the Grandmaster's arena. You can see Korg fighting alongside that strainer-headed gladiator from Thor Ragnarok, who also cameoed in last week's Party Thor episode. The Grandmaster dies in the blast as well. And then Ego gets hit, looking just as he did in Guardians Volume 2. The craters on the surface make his face in a shocked expression, with his mouth gaping open and his eyes widening. Oh no, I haven't had a chance to bang the other half of the universe yet. And then on to Xandar, which of course you saw in the first Guardians. During the Sentry attack, the Nova Corps tower does appear to be under reconstruction. Not just wreckage that Ultron has just caused, but apparently some attempts to rebuild from some past conflict. I thought it was just from Ronan's assault in the first Guardians film, but at the end of that movie, it was not this much under repair. So we might be looking at the aftermath of Thanos' recent attack to steal the Power Stone. It would justify how he got that stone, at least. Captain Marvel arrives to fight. Listen, Skynet. 
I've seen the Killer Robot movie, and I gotta say, I really don't think it needs a sequel. Yes, Skynet, referring to the robotic AI computer network that nukes the planet in the Terminator franchise. But this line about the sequel, well, we know Carol got abducted in 1989 and returned to Earth briefly in 1995, but then seemed to jet off with the scrolls. She did land in a blockbuster, but I don't think she had enough time to know that a sequel to the 1984 Terminator, the amazing T2 Judgment Day of 1991, was a way better film. So this killer robot movie that she was referring to totally needed its sequel, and her wrongness on this point, in my opinion, makes her deserve to lose to Ultron here. Now, Ultron was just about to call it quits. It's done. At last. The realization nearly broke the machine. Shut up, Uatu! The Watcher monologuing here did amount to intervention. Because had he said nothing, Ultron may have self-destructed or retired and never thought to move on to the other universes. So the Watcher has already kind of intervened. He's going to have to intervene to undo his intervention. Even after Ultron senses him behind his back the way Doctor Strange did in Episode 4, the Watcher continues. Who said that? Basking in the boundless silence of his universe, Ultron ascended to a previously unattainable level of consciousness. He became aware of another. He became aware of the... I see you. Yeah, this moment of realization is odd because yeah, again, we saw a separate moment of the Watcher first seeing Ultron Infinity at the end of the Party Thor episode. So when did the Watcher first recognize Ultron as a multiversal threat? Then or now? Now here at New Rockstars, our sharp wit and keen eyes can cut through the web of information out there to give you top-notch content, but to cut through food, you need Kamikoto knives. Kamikoto makes great Japanese steel kitchen knives using traditional techniques from Japan. Their knives are used by Michelin star restaurants around the world. They only use premium steel sourced from mills in Japan, and each Kamikoto knife is individually inspected after a 19-step process, which makes them so confident with their knives that each one comes with a lifetime guarantee. Each knife comes in a beautiful ash wood box that keeps the knife stored safely and makes a Kamikoto knife a great looking gift. They offer a range of Japanese steel knives from the 13-inch Yanagiba that can slice a full watermelon in half down to the 5-inch blade better suited for the smaller fruits and veggies, like a miniature watermelon. I grab a Nakiri knife and it feels incredible in my hand. It looks really cool. It feels well-balanced and super functional. It's got me itching to dice. Kamikoto has a big sale going on and is offering our viewers an extra $50 off any purchase with discount code NEWROCKSTARS. So head to kamikoto.com slash NEWROCKSTARS. Well, the watcher does say here I have seen everything that has ever happened ever will happen ever could happen and yet what the hell is this now yes there are multiple watchers in existence but I think this one voiced by Jeffrey Wright is just the same watcher that we saw at the end of episode 7 and I think this is his way of describing how he is just a multiversal being with his perception divided across an array of moments in history Kind of like he who remains, he's able to see the past, present, and future all at once. And we have one set of his eyes reacting to Ultron crashing party Thor, and then another set of his eyes reacting to Ultron here. And that only when Ultron responds to him behind that prison wall, despite him trying to wipe the blinds closed, does he finally see him as an existential threat to his script. And the heartbreaking aspect to the story that the watcher at the beginning of the episode is talking about is literally Ultron breaking the heart of his Prism multiverse. That's why this story breaks his heart more than the others. Also notice how much the Watcher blinks here. That was a little detail I pointed out last week as just a bit of evidence of Uatu's human-like fallibility. And now he blinks like crazy as if trying to wake up from a dream. If a hunger like that were to be unleashed upon the multiverse, even I cannot imagine the horrors that might follow. Yeah, the hunger is also the name given to the zombie virus in the Marvel Zombies comics, a virus that spreads across universes in the pages of the comics, unlike in the show. So I'm wondering if this show could actually follow through on what the virus is in the comics, and that the Watcher could try to use that multiversal hunger to neutralize this multiversal hunger. Clint and Natasha seek a Zola file in a KGB archives warehouse that Clint compares to the final shot of Raiders of the Lost Ark, and the camera tilts up in both versions of the shot. He also later references Star Wars. The Death Star plans are not in the main computer. And Natasha says, Hard copies are harder to steal, easier to destroy. But code, code is slippery. 
and it never dies. The lesson they learn from Ultron, of course, but also one that they will apply to Zola, perhaps foretelling how they might not be able to kill Ultron permanently, but rather they have to find a way to contain him. Natasha finds the shield of the Red Guardian, Alexei Shostakov from Black Widow. He did not have that shield in the Black Widow film, but his action figure did. In Arnim Zola's file box, there are some other names in Cyrillic letters. I didn't take the time to translate these. Oh wait, of course I did. They seem to be the names of a bunch of artists who worked on the What If series. There's Paul Lassane, he's the What If production designer. Then Molly Sotak and Fran Portillo, they're design coordinators for Marvel Studios. Then Cynthia Halley and Peter Bertucci, those are Marvel Studios artists. And then in the later shot, as Natasha thumbs through these, you can see Joshua Bramley, he's the What If asset supervisor. And then Sean something, and then El Grasso, and then Zachary, let's pull it up into two words, and then May Fam, maybe My Family. I'm just assuming all these are crew or friends and family. These are just the ones that I spotted. Ultron breaks into the Watcher's domain. I found you. I finally found you. In so many universes, so much chaos. They need to be silenced. You do not have to do this. Yeah, the Watcher begs using the same exact words that Tony Stark did, begging for his life. You don't have to do this. Which probably gives Ultron even more resolve to bring peace to all of existence by silencing it. Natasha and Clint find the same Siberian Hydra base from Captain America's Civil War, but here the tanks that contain the other Winter Soldier assassins are now all empty. Meaning Hydra might have deployed them to try to stop Ultron, and obviously failed. The Arnim Zola algorithm comes back on this computer terminal. Agents of shit. Romanov, Natalia Alianovna, Clinton, Francis. Of course, similar to how he greeted Steve and Natasha at Camp Lehigh in Captain America Winter Soldier, except now he calls them Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. R.I.P. So, in addition to Zola's AI presence living on in Camp Lehigh, secretly corrupting S.H.I.E.L.D. as Hydra, Zola was also present as a backup in the same place that Tony Stark realized Bucky killed his parents and Cap knew about it, leading to their fight. Makes me wonder how maybe in the main MCU, Zola could have been a silent partner to Zemo and helped supply him that footage as a way to haunt the Avengers from the grave of Hydra and giving one last F you to Captain Rogers. Either way, folks, Zola lives. Now, now they try to use Zola to infiltrate Ultron's code via his Sentry Hive Mind, the same way that he infiltrated S.H.I.E.L.D., and Clint does this by downloading him in one of his arrows, using that same awesome USB drive arrow that Clint used in the first Avengers film, and he plugs it into an Ultron Sentry with some cool color coding here, Zola's AI green replacing the Ultron red. Go light and stop light. They climb the same silo that Stark chased Cap and Bucky up in Civil War, and we see various alternate functions of Clint's arrows, like laser netting, a force field barrier, and one that just has a powerful boom boom, which might be what Clint is referring to with Kate Bishop in the upcoming Hawkeye series. This is too dangerous. Holy sh Their arrows more dangerous than that one? Natasha catches Clint, but in a mirror of Natasha's death in Endgame, Clint forces her to let him go. Actually, in the first Avengers film, Clint dove and turned back upwards mid-air to fire arrows up, but here he turns mid-air downward to face certain death. I love this shot of him falling slow motion in the swarm of centuries. Beautiful composition. Notice how they tilt the whole silo at an angle to make Clint's drop look like a deliberate strike. And then they widen out the silo way larger than it actually is in order to heighten the contrast of the one versus the many to give it all a more epic scale. Natasha lands from the explosion in the snow, making the pose that Yelena made fun of her for in Black Widow. Meanwhile, the Watcher and Ultron duel, and it rules! Uatu withstands a double blast of the Reality Stone and the Time Stone, though note that in this domain, which might be Uatu's version of the mirror dimension based on how it looks, Ultron doesn't use the practical functions of the Time Stone or the Reality Stone, like rewinding the flow of time or like turning Uatu's robes into beetles. They're simply just big energy blasts. And that might be a limitation of the stones outside of any one reality. Like you still remain an all powerful Nexus God, but these specific unique functions of the stones themselves might not be exactly usable here. Now the Watcher defends himself. I swore an oath. I cannot exert my will in the natural order of things. I cannot intervene. To whom did the Watcher swear this oath? In the comics, Uatu is one of many Watchers the one a 
assigned to our universe, and we know others exist in the MCU from the Guardians Volume 2 scene, but we may have to see Uatu answer to his fellow Watchers for his interference. Uatu blocks Ultron's Kirby crackles with a shield of glowing lines that look like celestial design, like the cosmic energy used by the Eternals. The Watchers and the Celestials have an antagonistic relationship in the comics over whether or not to interfere. Watchers swear not to, Celestials can't help monkeying with the monkeys. But notice how Uatu suits up in this combat armor, kind of like the Watcher Aeron the Renegade from the comics. But the fact that Watchers have armored forms, just like the Celestials have these armored forms, might be a clue that these two entities might have been at war with each other in Eon's past. Ultron tackles the Watcher through these different worlds. We see this pyramid planet, then an ice planet, then this interesting molten lava planet. Actually looks a lot like Mustafar from Star Wars. There is a castle in the background that looks like Vader's fortress. And come to think, the jungle planet did have some flora similar to the plant life of Felucia from Star Wars, so the animators might have worked in some Star Wars nods here. And then another ice planet, and then this rock planet with floating columns that a gargantuan Ultron bites down on, looming even larger than the whole galaxy, clearly a nod to Galactus, devourer of worlds, an entity that we have been pining to see in the MCU. I think it's the show's way of striking fear and awe of Ultron Infinity as a Galactus-sized threat. But even Galactus doesn't consume celestial bodies out of spite like this. He's driven by a custodial drive to Marie Kondo, the universe of dying dysfunctional planets. Then the Watcher crashes into Times Square with onlookers, including that pineapple shirt guy from Vegas in episode seven. There's also a billboard for Olympia the Musical, as we saw in Times Square in episode three, but nothing yet about Rogers the Musical, because I guess here, Steve Rogers is taking the oath of office to become the US president, something that does happen in the Ultimates comics. But perhaps in this universe, Steve Rogers only ran to prevent candidate Loki from becoming president. And that could be how that Loki got pruned to the void. Ultron's punch turns Times Square into Wakanda, and then to a medieval castle, and then to the Skrull Society. This could be their throne world of Tarnax 4. And then ending on another frozen planet, bringing Uatu full circle with the snowy beginnings this episode. Notice how as Ultron tries to crack the Watcher's head like an egg, steam sizzles off of it in the cold air. And this is also the way Captain Marvel tried to implode Ultron Ultron's head on Xandar, just showing how with every fight, Ultron is learning a new way to kill someone. But the Watcher is able to break free and retreats to his purple sphere, where back in episode 4, the Watcher left Strange Supreme. This time the framing is reversed from their first encounter. Uwatu now looks over his shoulder to see Strange creeping up behind him with all of his monstrous entities still part of him. But of course Uwatu has come here because Strange is the one other Nexus level being he might know of who might be able to help him fight Ultron. Are you ready to break your oath? Yeah, interesting to hear Strange talk this way as a doctor bound by his own Hippocratic oath to do no harm. But that doesn't apply to robots, I bet. The Watcher changes his tune. I see now. I need your help. Yeah, notice how the music shifts here from a dramatic orchestral swell and choir shrieks to a simple acoustic guitar melody over the credits. It was the music of Doctor Strange trying to work past his absolute point in episode four and now reflecting this new cooperation between the two. I think we can expect their solution to be one part using Zola's algorithm to de-link Ultron from his hive mind, one part using the hunger virus and another Infinity Stone arm threat. And ultimately, since Ultron remains a slippery code impossible to eradicate fully, trapping him the way Strange Supreme was trapped, perhaps by breaking the multiverse in such a way to leave it impossible to navigate. Maybe what that opening imagery of every episode showing spiraling, broken shards has been foretelling us this whole time. And of course, I think this series is going to set up the MCU with a broken, chaotic multiverse ahead of titles like Spider-Man No Way Home and Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. You can support New Rockstars by checking out our merch options at NewRockstarsMerch.com. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EAVoss. Follow and subscribe to New Rockstars. Thanks for watching. Bye. <laughs>